praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, we are so blessed once again to have you here, and it, it is truly an honor to have you, and, and we, I don't know, I'm just really looking forward to this message today uh, for a couple of reasons, really. Uh, number one, because uh, the material that's going to be presented today, uh, I, I'm not overselling it when I say it has the power to really impact your life today. Um, and, and second, I'm really excited about it because of the moms who are going to be sharing the message. Uh, we're going to be having my wife, Zandra, come and, and Heather uh, Morris come. So if you ladies want to come on up, um, I want to show before they, they get started, I, I hope to be able to show you how very real and relevant the material that they will be sharing with you is today. Um, according to a USA Today article from March 12th of this year, uh, we discover that over 20%, Samuel, next slide, over 20% of American adults, that's 50 million American adults, have reported experiencing a mental health challenge in the last year. Uh, anxiety is actually the most common mental health challenge in America with 19.1% of American adults wrestling with it on a regular basis. After that, we find depression. Uh, depression is next on the list with 8.3% of Americans experiencing a major depressive episode. And then 3.6% of Americans are wrestling with post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, those rates, those stats, don't include the increased number of mental health challenges that our children and our teenagers are experiencing. And, and with such a reality out there, it, it makes a person wonder, what does the Bible have to say? Is there something that God has for us to help us in his word? And the good news is, yes, he does. In his word, we have help for us today, and, and that's what Zandra and Heather are going to be sharing with us. They're going to help us learn how to win the battle in our minds, okay? And, and so here's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to split this message up into a couple of parts. Uh, Zandra is going to help us take a look at how God has wired our brains and how that wiring impacts how we go about calming our anxious minds, okay? And then after Xander's done, we're going to have Heather share uh, and, and help us look at how we can apply what God has shared with us in the scriptures so that we can win the battle in our minds, okay? So is everybody with me? Okay, three of you are. That's really encouraging. We're going with you three, okay? But uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have a word of prayer, and then Zandra's going to start. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. It is a lamp to our feet and a light to our paths. And we ask now, Lord, that you would come and do for us what we cannot do on our own. For, Lord, we can't preach apart from you. We can't even listen apart from you. And we sure can't, Lord, experience the power of your grace apart from you. So, Lord, we ask for the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit now to move through us and among us, and, Lord, to touch us that we might leave this place transformed more in the image of Christ, we pray in his name. Amen. And amen. All right. Well, I want to welcome Zandra. Good morning. I wonder how many of you can relate to irrational thoughts and runaway fears that often consume your mind. I don't know what it would be for you, but maybe you worry about something that seems normal. Let me give you an example. Let's say you're a college student and you're worried about not getting good grades. Why? Because if you get bad grades, you won't be able to get the job that you've been studying for. And if you don't get the job, you won't be able to afford to live on your own. 
And if you can't live on your own, you won't be able to marry the right person because they won't want to marry you because you're still living with your parents. We're just joking here, but it is easy for our minds to take us to places so far from where we started. There are also so many triggers that just that are just waiting to send us down paths of anxiety. What we watch on the news, a story you hear about a tragedy um, in a friend's life, the pile of bills that seem to get higher and higher, the decision you are making, uh, trying to make about your future. All these things and more can send our minds racing and fill us with real feelings of anxiety and fear. That's why we want to start the message off the right way in the Word of God. We'll be reading from Philippians 4, 6 through 8, and this is what it says. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. The title of today's message is Calm My Anxious Mind. And the good news today is that this passage of scripture um, in this passage of scripture, God has provided us the means to do that. I'd also like to share with you an overarching truth about our minds and thoughts. Our lives are always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. Now, this is great news if your thoughts are good, helpful, and positive. It's not so great if our thoughts are bad, unhelpful, or negative. So what can we do about this? Well, one of the things that can help us is to understand how our minds work. Our creator, uh, our creator God, has given us wisdom into how he created the mind. So what can we learn about the mind? In our mind, we have a little almond-shaped portion known as the amygdala. It is part of the brain that God wired for survival. If you have ever found yourself in a moment where you felt like you needed to fight or flight, you have had your amygdala actively engaged. When the amygdala kicks in, it sends your body strong doses of adrenaline and says, be on guard, be aware, be alert, and fight or run if you have to. This is the part of the brain that kicks in for me when I see a spider, any kind of spider. It says to me, spider, be careful, run, run, run. <laughs> it is the amygdala that kicks in when we are in traffic and another, car, another driver comes into our lane too fast onto the freeway and you have to slam on your brakes to avoid hitting them. Be aware, be alert, be careful. God created us with a portion of our, this portion of our brain for protection. The problem with the amygdala is it is not objective. It is simply hardwired to protect and it is very easily triggered. Let me give you an example. My kids and I witnessed a car accident several years ago. We were coming to a stop at a red light in the turn lane, and a car pulled up next to us in the next lane over. I got a brief look at the driver, and something didn't seem right. Then all of a sudden, she was rear-ended. It turned out that the driver had stopped, um, <laughs> had stopped driving, and the other car did not notice. I then realized that the driver was having a seizure, and that is why she had stopped driving. Brennan was in the front seat next to me, and he went instantly into panic mode.
sorry, I lost my spot. I started calling 911 since we witnessed the accident. All of a sudden, we had a driver from the vehicle behind us at my driver's side window, banging on our window and screaming that I needed to move. He obviously did not care about what just happened. Well, this made the tension in our car go through the roof. By this point, Brennan was also yelling, and the man continued to yell. We finally got moved and were on our way, but this did make it hard to function for a while. In these kinds of situations, our amygdala needs a little help from something else God created for us, our prefrontal cortex. This is the part of the brain that helps us think logically. So here is how this plays out. You hear a noise coming from the living room in the middle of the night. The amygdala screams, you are going to die. But then the prefrontal cortex steps in and says, no, you're not going to die. The dog isn't sleeping next to you anymore. It's probably the dog. The amygdala is all panic. The prefrontal cortex is all logic. Here is where the challenge comes in. The problem with the amygdala is it is always responds according to its pre-programming. I do not know what it might be in your life, but I imagine there are certain people or places or events or some type of news that triggers you uh, with all sorts of feelings of anxiety and fear and tension. Without even knowing it, your mind can take you to the worst case scenario where you find yourself panicking and wondering and trying to control things you can't because you are completely overwhelmed by a runaway mind. Let me offer you another powerful truth about our minds and anxiety. When we find anxiety taking over our minds, it is a sign we need to stop and pray. Prayer is always powerful. Not only does it move the heart and hands of God, but prayer also changes the chemistry in your brain. What we, were, what we are talking about here is another way God created our brains. The fancy term for it is neuroplastic, neuroplasticity. <laughs> anyway, you know what it is. <laughs> Basically, what it means is that our minds are continually changing, and it is possible for the brain to rewire itself. Here is, the, here is what the research shows. Prayer actually changes your brain. In her book, Switch on Your Brain, Dr. Caroline Leaf shares research that demonstrates that 12 minutes of focused prayer each day over an eight-week period can change, the, can change the brain to such an extent that it can be measured on a brain scan. So not only does prayer touch the heart of God, but it also changes the brain. Just as toxic and negative thoughts can harm your brain, God designed prayer to actually heal the brain, to transform the brain. It literally renews your mind. When Paul wrote uh, in Philippians 4 and told us not to be anxious about anything, he was speaking from experience. He gave this instruction while under arrest in Rome. He did not know what was going to happen moving forward. His future, humanly speaking, was uncertain, and it would have been easy to get on a path of thinking that led to some pretty scary places. But I believe Paul practiced what he preached and experienced the peace of God and the renewing of his mind. For us, it could be a big test, a job interview, a health situation, a decision that has implications for the future. So let's work, let's work it out step by step through Philippians 4, 6 through 7. 
do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, in other words, if it's on your mind, it's on God's heart. He cares about you and loves you more than you can imagine. By prayer and petition with thanksgiving, again, I am sensing anxiety in my mind. It is a signal I need to pray. And I start with thanksgiving because it helps me remember that God has been faithful to me in the past and he will be faithful in the present. What do we do next? Present our request to God. What are the results of making a, a present of my anxious thoughts to God? The renewing work of the Holy Spirit activates the prefrontal cortex in our minds. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I love how God created us and works with how God uses the scriptures to inform us and help us. At this point, I am going to hand off the message to Heather and let her help us look at some additional possibilities and applications. So one of the real questions we have that oftentimes goes completely unanswered is the why question. And it's very easy in our world to just completely negate why and just treat the symptoms, but not actually address the root cause. As Andrew has showed us, when it comes to calming our anxiety, we have to recognize, and oftentimes, what has caused this amygdala hijack. So that little amygdala, which I had to look up how to pronounce, to be completely honest, it's very strange because it tells us, oh, you're in trouble. Well, you better take control. Better than that, you better work harder. You're not working hard enough. Oh, you've got to stay up till 2, 3 in the morning just worrying, obsessing, pour over it. Because if you don't, things are only going to get worse and you're only going to blame yourself. Let's be honest. We've all been there. I have. Unfortunately, I come from a, a line of worriers. Now, let us be honest. We do not discount the impact that an overactive of Lila has, but as followers of the risen Savior, we also know that this is spiritual warfare. That is all right here. That sneaky snake, that enemy of our souls, would love for nothing more for us to take our focus, take our eyes, and put it on the circumstance, the challenge, the fear, and not on the power of Messiah. He wants, once again, that nasty little liar wants us to forget and just completely disregard the promises that we have and the power, the infinite power of God. The enemy of our souls would like us for, to put doubt in God that he actually cares about us. If he cared about you, this A, B, and C wouldn't be happening. What you're going through... Ugh. God's so good, I'm so sick of that term. And then lastly, part of the end goal of the enemy, he wants us to display our attitude back towards God of distrust and you don't care about me, well fine, I don't trust you. Worry is an extremely powerful weapon in the enemy's arsenal and he loves nothing more than to plant those seeds of worry and doubt of every chance he can get into your mind. And he loves to water them with worry, use that wiring that God has given us against us. And oftentimes what happens is we surrender our control and our thoughts without being fully aware of what we're doing. Again, scripture is just so beautiful here. For Paul gives us in Corinthians some beautiful insight of our weapons. I love our spiritual weapons. So in 2 Corinthians... If you wouldn't mind, if you can, 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5. For our weapons 
of our warfare are not fleshly, but powerful through God for tearing down strongholds. We are tearing down false arguments and every high-minded thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. We are taking every thought captive and obedient to Messiah Jesus. You got to take it captive. Pull it down. Declare, I am a child of the conquering risen Savior. So, once again, Paul's got some really sweet writings. If we can flip over to Philippians 4, 8. Thought I'd get more of a chuckle from my little section over there, but that's fine. <laughs> so Philippians 4, 8 says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's anything of virtue, if there's anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. So what we're going to do is we're going to say this. I choose, I am going to think on what is true, what is noble, what is right, what is pure, everything that's lovely, everything admirable, what is ever excellent of worthy and praise. I am declaring, I am thinking on those things and not the lies. From the psychological standpoint, what we're doing was we're grabbing the amygdala by its tail and we're just saying, stop being irrational. But what I love, imagine you're, you're, you're suited up in the full armor of God. And what you're saying is, Satan, shut it. Stop. I refuse to listen to your lies. I am battling with the sword of the spirit. And I'm going to bring down those strongholds. In these moments, we are taking an active choice of faith. We are professing with our mouth what we believe. We are choosing to trust and say to ourselves and to God, I trust in my Father. I believe in you. I give you my burdens, my worries, my concerns. My irrational fears start to run wild. I am choosing to stop, grab them by the tail, and surrender them to the Lord. I am choosing to make them obedient to the cross, and I'm putting my hope and my faith in him. This happened to me completely by accident. Like I said, I'm from a line of warriors, and in what we choose for our kids' schooling, it just comes with this territory of comments, criticism, and critiques, and comparisons. And our sweet youngest at the end of August was, I'll just be honest, struggling with reading. Every kid learns differently, and it was a struggle, but like I said, we come with a whole pack of comparisons, criticism, critiques. And I'm gathering up their school books, and my arms are full, and I'm like praying, worrying to God, and it's this literal like, Lord, I don't want to do. It's been so different between Aiden and Adler and Andrew, I just don't know. And I literally heard the Holy Spirit speak so clear in my spirit. I wasn't actively renewing my mind, but in this moment of grace, he said, the only thing that matters in this life is to know me and be known by me. And everything else is secondary. I just wept. My arms are full of school books. I'm crying because I knew what he was saying in that moment. This life, the only thing that matters, it's not test scores or reading or math. Those are great things. I'm not discrediting those. But to live in the mind of following unashamed Christ, to know him, to be known by him, and live it out to whoever's around us so that they will, be, well, they will know him and be known by him. It wasn't that long ago that everyone in your house was learning to read from the Bible. It's a choice, but it starts right here. So I'm going to give you a homework assignment. I usually don't do this, and if you were to ask my kids, they'd be like, we do homework every day. 
But I hope it finds you helpful. When you get home, get a shoe box, a cereal box, an oatmeal box, just a box box, and label it God box. Now, anytime you have those anxious thoughts that are just picking at you, write it down. There's something about writing things down, getting it out of your head. Whew, write it down. Get the root cause, not the symptoms, but write the root cause down. Pray about it and put it in God's box because you're physically showing you're giving it to him. Now, here's the really hard part. You got to leave it in God's box. Walk away and have him have total trust, and you have to trust him. But anytime you choose to worry about that, you've got to walk back over to your God box and take it out. But if we do that, we're demonstrating that we're choosing to take back the worry and not have unabandoned trust in our Heavenly Father. It's hard. But sometimes we've got to do the physical, what we are doing in the mental Here's something else that can help us set us free in our mind. Instead of just giving worries here and there to the Lord, it is totally best, and I can guarantee it's totally worth it, just to surrender your whole life to God so that you are hidden in Christ, as Colossians 3.3 3 so beautifully tells us. It's truly a liberating experience to give your whole life to him, everything, trusting in him and his goodness and his mercy, his love, his, unfaith his faithfulness that lasts forever. Here's freedom from fear, peace for your troubled mind, releasing of all that control to God. Something about total surrender. I can't fully put into words, but it is just like a sigh of fresh air after a long time, just, oh, he's got me. Let's see about three practical ways that we can kind of help us think about this. First, I'm going to do what I can do. So the example of the student was given, which was really funny. I was thinking of that. I'm going to live in a van down by the river. I mean, it's true. But... Back up. If you're a student, you know, you got a test coming up. Something my dad loved to say, I think, to us and to his students is, I pray the Lord will bring back to your mind everything you studied for. Yeah, he got some groans from some students, but it's true. You're going to do your part. You got to study. If you got a test, you got to study. You can't just wing it all the time. Actually, never wing it. Because the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy to study, to show yourself approved. So you got to study. Or if you're trying to get healthy, you just can't say, Lord, make me healthy. And that's all you do. You got to put feet to your faith. You know, make wise decisions about food, you know. Get wiggly, move your body. You got you to gotta do what you're supposed to do. Number two, I'm going to give God what I can't. Let's face it. We have to recognize there's a lot of things that we can't do. We have to have his assistance. We need his help desperately. Some circumstances are, decisions are just way out of our hands. But it doesn't matter. Because we have a God who's literally holding the universe. So if he's holding the universe, nothing's out of his hands. And then the hard one is I'm going to trust God no matter what. Even if things don't turn out the way that I hoped um, even if the answer to my prayer is, wait, I'm still going to trust God no matter what because of who he is, because he loves us, because he's faithful and true. <clears throat> when Pastor Jeremy asked me to do this and I got the message, and I was like, all right, Lord, you speak through. I, I need to have some practical truths here. And I knew what I was going to say when it came to this one, but I didn't know how I've been toying it over in my mind until last night, I'll be honest, as I was laying in bed and the tears were falling. I'm going to trust God no matter what. Probably the two greatest people that I've ever seen this in my life have been my parents. Through it all. On the outside, you probably say, oh, they, everything was put together, but it's not. Between health and um, loss, 
my dad's five bypass surgery was actually like right before I turned 13. And that was a failure, but I can remember my mom praying in the spirit, declaring the word of the Lord. We didn't know. But in that instance, God chose to heal him. Um, through our loss, things, they were always there. I can remember with Aiden, things were great until the very end. And on my dad's birthday, everything went just, it went shot. And I was terrified I was going to lose my child. And my mom said, honey, you're going to have to give him to Jesus. Like I had to with you. And so we did, through the tears, I gave him over to the Lord. So glad I did. All three of those boys are miracles in their own way that mom walked with me how to give them to the Lord. When dad died, same thing. He's with Jesus. We got to let him go to Jesus. Through my Uncle Carol's cancer diagnosis, I was terrified. Mom said, we got to give him to Jesus. Through grandmom's cancer, granddad's cancer, they're passing. You got to give them to Jesus. Well, I'm walking that right now. I prayed. I believed. I wept. I declared healing and restoration for my mom. I laid my hands on her. We both did. Kept telling the boys, we're going to pray for healing and restoration because our God is so big. But what ever happens, we are leaving it in his hands. And on November 30th at 7.07 in the morning, the prayers were answered, but not how I asked. But I can guarantee you that she is dancing and free with Jesus. But it's a choice. It's not easy, but it's a choice. It's our choice. We have to look at our thoughts. They are ultimately dominated by two things. Is it what I want and my will, or is it Holy Spirit's will? Sandra has shared with us earlier that our lives are always driven in the direction of our strongest thoughts. So my question to you, do you like where your life's going? If not, what can we do? Well, we have to identify the lies that we've been believing, whatever it may be. And sometimes it comes from a place of a diagnosis. I get it. But we have a choice. Who are we listening to? What's the lie that the enemy has been using to talk to you and talk you out of truth? And when we identify that lie, we're going to replace it with the truth of God. Philippians 4, 8. Lovely, pure, commendable, admirable. We're going to replace it. Then what we do with the truth? Write it down. Journal it. Sticky note it. Put it on your phone. Write it down five million times. Get it into your heart and mind. Whatever it takes. Put it somewhere you can like go pull it out. So anytime he starts to whisper, say, not today, Satan, and pull it out. After you write it down, read it a bajillion times. Over and over and over, over and over. In fact, if you want to make these truths a declaration, that's awesome. Declare it over you. Our mouths are so powerful. Declare his truths over you. Because that's freedom in our awesome Christ. How about some ideas to start with today? Okay? All right. So here's some truths that I would love to speak over you today. You are not a hostage of unhealthy thoughts because the weapons we fight with are spiritual weapons that have divine power to demolish strongholds. And the power and the authority of the risen Savior, you are demolishing every pretentious thing that sets itself against God. 
pull it down. Guess what? Worry's not your master. You are trusting in the almighty God and his peace guards your heart and your mind and your soul and none other than Christ Jesus. You aren't a slave to habits. Sorry, that line needs to go too. Actually, I'm not sorry. Kick it. You're not a slave to habits. You're not a prisoner of addiction. No. Mm. Used to sing a song as a kid, Satan's under my feet, and we would just stomp the living snot out of the ground. Do it. You're not a prisoner. You're an overcomer by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. You know you cannot control everything, and that's okay. Even things that happen to you, you can't control. But we control how we, how we frame our thoughts, how they flow through our mind. You're in control of this, and that's great. You don't interpret God by what's going on. No, no, flip it. You interpret your circumstances on the goodness of our God. You will not be anxious about anything. No, I declare. But in everything with prayer and petition, you're going to take that request to God, and the peace of God will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Amen. And lastly, as a follower of Christ, I declare that you know the truth, and the truth sets you free. You are empowered by God's truth to win the war of your mind. You're going to step out of the lies, and you are going to step into the truth of Almighty God. Well, we're going to have Xander come, and we're going to close this service uh, this morning with a song. And as we do, um, I encourage you just to listen to the words and if there's been something that the Spirit has been speaking into you throughout this message, these altars are open for anyone to come and to pray. Maybe there's some worries and anxiety that you need to give over to the Lord. Maybe there's some situations that you need to give over to the Lord. Maybe it's something entirely different. But I just believe that you cannot have heard a message like this one without the Spirit of the Lord touching you in some way. And so if you need to come in to pray, you're welcome to. But I want to remind you, as Heather has said, you are an overcomer by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony.